Um, tonight we're going to talk about something else that has um, long been a real um, source of stumbling for God's people. And um, again, there is, there's been a lot of believing on this that's just not in the Word of God. And <laughs> I seriously, I, okay, anyways. <laughs> and I can't even delete that out. Okay. Um, but a lot of wrong believing has um, gotten God's people into agreeing with and therefore permitting things in their lives that they were never to agree with or permit. And um, so as a result, our good shepherd then has not looked to everyone like the good shepherd that he is. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about temptations, <coughs> afflictions, sufferings, and persecutions. Okay, the Bible without a doubt speaks of them and that we are going to encounter them. But we better, we better get them right on line six. Okay, and um, the Bible says we'll face them, yes, but Satan has lied to us, um, to the people of God, to the believer, and then on account of it, we believe some things that are in direct disagreement with the word of God on the topic. And that wrong believing has been giving place to the devil in our lives. So tonight, I'm going to once again just take the word of God and put it out front and position myself behind it, right? And just repeat what God says in here, in the word of God. Okay, and then let this alive and powerful word fight its own fight. Okay? Um, and so I need the anointing to teach tonight, that the anointing is going to do the teaching tonight, not Dorothy St. Pierre, and so that this word lands right, lands in your hearts right. So that's why I have Joe here, because he's going to open in prayer again for us tonight. Okay? Praise you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for gathering us together, and you say when two or three days you're not in your name, you are among them, and we believe that you are here right now, Lord. Lord, open our hearts, open our ears, Lord. Let us hear your word and penetrate on the pit of our stomach, or the pit of our heart, that you would just penetrate on everyone who's here to let them hear the proper, the right word. Yeah. And we give you praise, we give you glory and honor. We pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Joe. Okay, uh, we're going to read a lot of scripture today. Um, okay, so again, like I said, tonight we're going to talk about temptations, sufferings, afflictions, and persecutions. What they are, what they are not, and why they are key to our walk with God. Okay, so now Dorothy, doesn't the Bible say that many are the afflictions of the righteous? And doesn't it say that there will be temptations and sufferings, right? In fact, you know, doesn't the Bible say that we are to be partakers in Christ's sufferings, to know the fellowship of his sufferings? And so then, isn't, Dorothy, what I've been going through to be expected as a believer, right? Just one of those sufferings. Isn't it just par for the course? You know, just goes along with life on the planet, being a human on this planet. And, you know, like headaches when I get stressed or something like that, or... Um, you know, not always having what I need to pay my bills. Um, isn't that just something you got to work through because you, there's going to be sufferings and afflictions in this life? The Bible says so, right, Dorothy? Okay. Yes, they will show up. But let's get clarity now from God's word just exactly what God's talking about with those things. Right? Not what the enemy has talked to us about and what he has gotten us into believing about those things. Okay, providing us with doctrines to explain away our circumstances and thereby remain in them. Okay, so to get us to change the word to match, to match our experience, right? Rather than to believe and cooperate with the word to change our experience. Okay, so, but Dorothy didn't say, didn't the, doesn't the Bible say many are the afflictions of the righteous? Yes, it does, right? Psalm 34, 19 says that. But where did the rest of that verse sneak off to? Right? Because in my Bible, it says, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Okay? And so, yes, the Bible does say we are to be partakers in Christ's sufferings. But, we know, but we've got to know what God says those are those things are not the devil and god knows what they are okay 
And so, in fact, here's the verse, 1 Peter 4, 13. It says this, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Okay, so being, apparently being involved in those ones, the kind that God's talking about, produces gladness and joy. Okay, Philippians 3.10 in the NAV says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Okay, the Bible says that. Okay, we just read that. All right, so um, Jesus is always our example, correct? And so we're going to look at him. So temptation, sufferings, afflictions, and persecution. So go with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you verses 1 to 4. This is the account of Jesus having been led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Okay? So Matthew 4, 1 to 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Okay, so clearly we see here that Jesus is tempted of the devil. Okay, so temptations. All right. Now, Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he hungered, right? You think? 40 days, 40 nights, no food. And so just like a devil does, Satan then comes and tells Jesus, you know, just make the stones bread. And so, but Jesus, we see Jesus, Jesus resists that suggestion, that temptation, with the word of God coming from his mouth. It is written. Okay? Correct? Every time, you will see it in this chapter, every time, verse 4, verse 7, verse 10, Jesus resists temptation by refusing to yield to it and agreeing with the word of God instead, speaking it off, speaking that off his tongue to the situation. Okay? But he's hungry, right? I mean, so hungry. And like, can you imagine, right? So I bet his flesh is fighting him on it. Because, I mean, Jesus, he's a man here because here, um, Hebrews 2.17 says he was fully human in every way. Hebrews 2.17. So, yeah, I mean, stones to hot bread at this point, right? It's like, that's sounding pretty good, right? But he refuses to yield to the temptation of, for that bread, okay? Suffering. Okay, follow me. Sometimes I feel like it's suffering when I have to say no to a piece of pie and I just ate an entire meal. Okay, it's like suffering. And here not for 40 days or 40 nights, okay? So now what is the result of Jesus resisting? The result of his resisting is verse 11. The devil left and angels came and ministered to him. And Hebrews 1.14 calls them all ministering spirits sent forth to serve those who be heirs of salvation. Okay? Now, that's not the only account in Scripture where Jesus faces, some, faces temptation. And he handles it the very same way every time. He refuses to yield, and he sticks with what God said. Okay? Now, apparently it was no picnic, right? No more than it is for you when you're tempted to do something. Okay? When <clears throat> that pull to do something is so strong, and your flesh is applying such pressure... Right? And you either fight it hard or you yield to it. Suffering. Okay? Luke 22, verse 40. Let me just, let's go over there. Luke 22. This is the other, this is another account where Jesus faces temptation. Okay, so this is the account where Jesus is with his disciples and he tells them, because he's about to go to the cross. Okay, let me read that verse first. 
And when he was at the place, he said unto them, to his disciples, pray that you enter not into temptation. Okay? So notice here he didn't say pray that temptation doesn't come. He said pray that you don't enter into it. Okay? And so <clears throat> here Jesus is about to face more temptation. And he tells his disciples to do what he's doing. He says, pray like I am, that you enter not into the temptation, that you resist it. Okay? Like Jesus resisted it in the wilderness. Resist it, that you enter not into it. Okay? Then verses um, 41 and 42, we'll go on to read. and says, and he was withdrawn, Jesus, from them about a stone's cast, kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So here we see Jesus resisting again. The temptation to bypass the cross. The temptation to have this cup removed from him. Okay? And we see him resist by choosing to agree with the word of God. God's word that had already been prophesied back in Isaiah by Isaiah in chapters 51 and 52, for example, right? How it was the plan that God, that it was God's plan that Jesus would suffer and die and be raised again. Okay? So Jesus resists again by agreeing with God and speaking, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Jesus yielded to the plan, not to the pressure. Okay, so we see in this account, we see Jesus resist again, resist temptation with the word of God in agreeing with it, with the word of God. And again, what was the result here? We see in verse 43, there came those angels again, ministering spirits to him. Okay, and in there's, then in verse 44, we even read where it says, and being in agony, so apparently, there's agony involved. There's suffering involved in the resisting of temptation to sin. Right? To do something other than God's plan. And in Jesus' case, to by bypass the cross. Okay? Then let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 15. Yeah. Hebrews 4, 15. Okay, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Okay, so now hear me. Satan has tried to sell the believer that when the scriptures talk about being partakers in Christ's sufferings, that somehow that includes junk out of the curse. Sickness, disease, lack, fear, struggles in bondage, but Jesus never suffered with sin or fear or bondage or sickness or lack or anything else out of the curse. None of those things were Christ's sufferings. Okay? But Dorothy, Jesus was poor. Absolutely not. Not true, right? You know, you know when he did become poor though? At the cross at the same time that he was made the curse for us Galatians 3 right because poverty is a part of the curse and he was made to be the curse for us it was at the same time where he borrowed he bore our griefs carried our sorrows Isaiah 53 it was the same time where he bore our sins first Peter 2 24 it was at the same time where he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses Matthew 8 17 okay right then Right? And at that same time, he took on himself all the rest of the junk so we would never have to have it. Okay? And the scripture says this. This is 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was what? 
Louder off for the link. Rich. Though he was rich, right? So though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. That you and I, through his poverty, might be rich. Okay? But no, Dorothy, Jesus was born in a stable, right? Poor people are born there. Okay. I'm sorry. Does the Bible say they couldn't afford the inn? Or there was no room in it? Okay? Let's not make stuff up. All right? For honest sakes, Jesus wasn't on the ground for more than a bit, and there's three rich guys looking for him. Right? I mean, poor men don't have treasures. Right, Jesus, you are Judases that are appointed to carry money bags for you, inside which is so much that no one realizes he's been skimming off the top for how long? Right? Nobody draws lots to divide a poor man's robe when he dies. Come on, people of God. We've been believing junk. God himself said Jesus was rich when he said, though he was rich, okay, on the cross he had to become poor. He wasn't poor, he had to become it. Okay? Um, the only time, the only time Jesus suffered with any of that, that any of that junk ever touched him was at the cross when he took it upon himself. Okay? When he took it on himself for us, it wasn't his, it was ours. Okay? So the scripture says, 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ has also once suffered for sins. Once suffered on the account of that junk. For the just, or the just for the unjust... And then watch for one reason, that he might bring us to God. Okay? So, in fact, Jesus lacked nothing. Okay? Because neither did the 12 guys, 12 guys that were working for him. Because do you remember that scripture where Jesus asked him and says, you know, um, says, lacked you anything? You know, when you've been with me in ministry and all that, had lacked you anything, Luke twenty two thirty five, 35. And they said, nothing, Lord. Nothing. Okay, the curse never touched Jesus until he took it at the cross. Right? For honest sakes, death couldn't even take his life until he gave it up. Okay? And then what's more, we see in Isaiah 53, verse 7, when Jesus is being sentenced to death, that scripture says, He opened not his mouth. He had but to open his mouth once. And the Bible says 12 legion of angels, angels would have showed up. Matthew 26, 53. He had to be in control of that powerful mouth of his. Or that thing would have been over in an instant. Right? There would have been no cross. We'd all still be lost, pummeled by the curse. We have been making stuff up. Right? Creating suffering doctrines and calling them sharing in the sufferings of Christ to justify why we're still suffering with junk out of the curse. But uh-uh, not the same suffering at all. Okay? The suffering for the believer is in the resisting of sin. It's it, like Jesus, right? The resisting of temptation. It's in, the, it, it's in the resisting of the devil in his garbage. That's the suffering. And you know what, it like is, what it's like if you've done it. It feels like suffering. If you're going to keep at it. Okay? We've got to know the difference or Satan is going to try and get us to agree with suffering with stuff that comes out of the curse. And that is not what scripture is talking about at all. Okay, but no, Dorothy, in the wilderness, Jesus suffered from lack, right? He had no food. He was hungry. No, 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 no. Remember? He was fasting. Okay? And a God-directed fast because the Bible says that the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Correct? So was Jesus opposed to bread? Of course not. Right? I mean, the issue here was that God didn't tell Jesus to make the stones bread. The devil did. And Jesus was not about to yield to the devil's suggestions for anything. Right? Has God got trouble providing bread? Food? Right? What about Jesus? 
Does he have a problem? Well, I mean, we see in Scripture, I mean, when Israel was in the wilderness, for example, bread rained down from God, rained bread down on them. Right? I mean, Exodus 16, bread's not a problem. Food supply, not a problem for God. Right? Later, Jesus provides so much fish that the nets break. Okay? A food is not as food supply is not an issue, right? Sends Peter out to, and he, he brings a fish right to him with tax money in its mouth to boot. Right? <laughs> Provision is not a problem. Jesus himself multiplies those and fishes. Okay, so enough of that nonsense. Let's just delete that out. Okay? In the curse is sickness and lack and fear, bondage to sin, and everything else that's listed in Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to the end of the chapter, lists all the junk that's inside the curse, okay? And then Jesus went to the cross and redeemed us from every part of the curse. We see that in Galatians 3, 13 and 14, okay? So if he's gone through all he did to redeem us from it, all of it, then we can expect that it's, he expects actually that it should be nowhere in our lives. Correct? Okay. So this is going to help you. Anything that comes out of the curse, resist. Anything that Jesus bore on the cross, resist. Okay. And the devil's not going to make it easy to resist. He's going to come for the word's sake. Right? Hoping that by upping the pressure, you're going to let go of it. You'll stop resisting. Okay? Or encourage your flesh to be too lazy to resist it. Right? Things like, oh, it's just a runny nose. You know, that's tolerable. You know, I don't feel like taking the word or resisting it and all that's a lot of work. Besides, it'll pass in a couple days. Everybody gets cold. And then we don't resist. It's too much work to resist right suffering besides these things just come with life on the planet you know part of the sufferings that the bible talks about do you see how this is a real problem okay if you believe that the sufferings of christ are what we are to be partakers in and that it involves junk that comes out of the curse you will yield to that junk out of the curse that jesus went to the cross to redeem us from believing it to be god's will and then not stand against it not resist it not get rid of it. Making Jesus trip to the cross to be made the curse for us, pointless. And then claiming to be sheep of the good shepherd, we show up sick and broke and beaten up and defeated and that reflects on him. Exactly what the devil loves. That helps his cause immensely. For the lost to never see the kindness of a good shepherd. Okay, so back to temptations. Hebrews 4.15. We're still in Hebrews 4. So I just read that one. Let's read it again. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we, like as we are, yet without sin. So here Jesus was tempted. We will be tempted. That is a given. But we can be tempted to and not succumb to sin. We can resist it too. But we're going to need to do it with the word like he did. Okay? Hebrews 2.18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to help them that are tempted. Okay? So the suffering that is to come, the suffering is what comes with the resistance to temptation, the refusal to bow to it. Okay, and the scripture says Jesus himself suffered being tempted, the sufferings of Christ. Okay, Hebrews 5, 8, For though he, Jesus, were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Okay, now pay attention here because it was not from discipline or correction because Jesus never sinned. Okay? But he learned obedience by the resisting of temptation. By the suffering that came with that. Okay? Hebrews 12. I'm just actually going to read all those verses there. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. And read verses 1 to 4. We'll start there. 
Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin with which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your mind, for you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Okay, so here we see that the suffering, so Jesus, he endured the cross, you and it says you have not yet you have not you and i have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin we have never had to resist that hard okay the suffering was such that actually that jesus actually resisted to the point of sweating drops of blood that's what the scriptures say right the suffering came with the resisting or the striving the fighting against sin against that temptation to bypass the cross okay now here th this is what i do in my own thinking so i keep that straight because you've been you get taught stuff for so long and then it takes time to undo it in your thinking and this is what helps me whenever i read or i hear the word suffering in scripture or sufferings in scripture i just mentally remind myself by subbing in the word resistings Okay, so I do it this way. So like, for example, um, Hebrews 2.18 that we just read. For in that, it reads this way. For in that he himself has resist, has suffered being tempted. Okay, so then I will, in my mind, also connect in there. For in that he himself has suffered, resisted, being tempted. So I keep that in front of me. Okay, or though he, Jesus, were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Or by the things which he, and I think, suffered. By the things which he resisted. Okay? Alright, now think for a moment. In your own life, some real suffering can have come from resisting sin. Right? The suffering that comes from resisting when your flesh wants to lay down. Right? When temptation... Um, when temptation comes to you, temptation is going to be here as long as there's a devil on the loose, right? It's a given. Um, um, but you, the thing is that we never need to yield to it. Okay? We don't ever need to yield to it. Jesus didn't. Okay? And suffering comes with the refusal to yield. When your flesh does not want to do what it needs to do, and when it has a mind of its own, and it's fighting you and God on a thing. Okay, so like for example, when um, the pull of that addiction you're wanting so hard to be free from, free from comes on so strong, and you're saying no, 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 suffering. Okay, when everything in you wants to fall down over financial crisis and cry in complete frustration and stay there, and then go back to bed and leave, leave the lights off. But you pull yourself up. You get your cute self ready and off to church you go. Suffering. Making your flesh do what your flesh doesn't want to do. Okay? Not easy, right? When your flesh wants one thing and you're making it do another. When you sit down in front of your accusers. And they're lying straight to your face. You know it. And you, they don't know you know it. And your flesh just wants a moment to turn the light on that whole mess. You know you can. And make it clear. You might have been born at night, but not last night. Right? And then God, the living God, speaks to your spirit and tells you, you keep your mouth shut. So, you just smile and you take it. Suffering. In Dorothyville... That is suffering. <laughs> right? When the pressure is so great and you open your eyes in the morning and for the first 30 seconds, it is a glorious day. Right? Until your memory, in an instant, right, brings you right back up to speed with the crisis situation that hasn't yet resolved. 
Okay, it's still the evidence is still there, and then everything in your flesh just wants to turn over, have a quick party, remind yourself how exhausted you are from all this and from the battle, and go back to sleep so you don't have to think about it. Amen. Right? <laughs> but no, up you get, right? Up you get telling your flesh just exactly how exciting it's going to be for this new day. Amen. <laughs> Suffering. Are you hearing me? It's the battle to order a wrong thought out of your head a hundred times a day, if need be, <coughs> rather than yield to it. And do that all day. Then get up and do the same thing tomorrow and the next day till that foul thing gets starved out. Right? And all the while, your flesh has had enough of that whole resist routine you've been doing, right? And just wants to lay down and give in. Suffering. It's your spirit bringing your flesh under subjection. Suffering. Okay? It's resisting the temptation to do other than what the Word of God says. Resisting the temptation to say different than the Word says. Right? Like rehearsing how tough the problem is just so everyone knows how hard it's been for you. What, is, what does God tell us? Resist the devil. And he will flee from you, James 4, 7. No wonder God tells us that. But all oh, the sweet reward in resisting like Jesus did, like God told us to, being part of that suffering. Okay, because watch this. Romans 8, 16 to 18. Then the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see in this? Glory comes out of doing all it takes to obey. To obey God. Okay? Now look what Jesus said to his father as he was wrapping up on the earth. Having res resisted all sin, all temptation, he did it all perfectly. He said this to God, to his father. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. Obedience brings glory to God. I have finished the work you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. John 17, 4 and 5. Are you seeing this? Okay, now let's look at afflictions. Somehow in our thinking, we have come to equate, um, equate affliction with some sickness or ailment or disease. And we use terms like, you know, afflicted with illness, afflicted with a deadly disease, afflicted with mental illness. Okay, now, and that is because our dictionaries, in our dictionaries, afflicted is defined as, and I quote, I wrote it down, impaired or stricken, and usually referring to a person who is mentally or physically unfit or has been grievously affected by disease. So then when we read the Bible, and we read, many are the afflictions of the righteous, we get believing wrong. Are you hearing me? Yet, that's not what the Bible word afflictions is. Okay, but we've, we've not bothered to check into what God says on it. We've just gone by what man has said on it. Okay, so let's pull some scriptures that speak of affliction or afflictions. Okay? We're going to start with Acts 7. Acts 7, verse 34. Acts 7, 34. Reads this. And each one of these cases of the word affliction, I looked up in the Greek, um, when you can go on to the Blue Letter Bible, and you can look exactly what that word means and in, used in that context. Okay, so Acts 7.34, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning. Here that affliction means persecution and mistreatment of God's people, the Israelites. Okay, let's keep going. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.6, 
and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. The affliction there, when you receive the word in much affliction, that one means a pressing, pressure, persecution. So persecution came with the receiving of the word. Affliction. Okay, Hebrews 11.25, speaking of Moses. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That one again translated is persecution, but persecution suffered together. Affliction. James 5.10, take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. That word affliction refers to evil, adversity, a coming against. Persecution. Affliction. Okay? Psalm 34.19, the one we've used already, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of the wall. We might as well know what this one here means because it gets used. Evil, adversity, a coming against. Many are those, many are the coming against of the righteous. Okay? But the Lord delivers them out of them all. Okay? First, Tim, First Thessalonians 3, 2 and 3. So here, um, they sent Timothy to a group of believers to do this. To, and I'm quoting scripture, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. That one there is translated oppressing, pressure, persecution. Okay? For you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Okay? And so apparently, those were appointed unto. Affliction, persecution that comes as a result of the word, we're appointed to. Okay? Now, just wait a minute. Okay, so now in that scripture, moved by what afflictions? Because apparently these afflictions, again, are unavoidable because we're appointed to them. Okay? So what we're going to do to find out what these afflictions are, let's back up one chapter, okay? And we're going to find out. That, so that's 1 Thessalonians 2, and we read verses 13 to 16. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which are in Judea and are in Christ Jesus. For you, have, for you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Okay, so what were the afflictions? being persecuted by people around them, even their own countrymen, the scripture says, for the word of God they'd received and that they were teaching. Okay? 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 12. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Are you seeing this? Will suffer persecutions. So over and over, affliction in the New Testament is connected to pressure. Persecution. Evil coming against you. Satan enticing people against you. <clears throat> Satan stir stirring up circumstances against you. Okay? And let's look at why Jesus says that is again. Now we know this, but let's just look at it again because he's very clear. Jesus is very clear on how this goes. 
Let's go back to Mark 4. And I'm just going to start reading. I read verses 13 through 17. And Jesus, so this is Jesus talking. He said, and, and he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? The sower sows the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and having no root in themselves, so endure but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Okay, so here we see. The word of God is sown. And when they hear it, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Okay? He's after getting that word out of you. Because if it stays in you, it is going to produce. Okay? So they hear the word, they immediately receive it with gladness. But afterward, when tribulation or persecution for the word's sake comes, immediately they stumble, another translation says. Okay, Bible affliction is linked to tribulation and persecution and is designed by hell to get you to let go of the word of God, to get you to turn loose of it, to not teach it, to not preach it, to not receive it, to not live by it, to doubt it. Right? Because when you do that, Satan can effectively stop everything. Because God's word is everything. We've learned that. Okay? And Satan coming to steal the word happens through people, right? Some meaning well, some not. Okay? But through negative circumstances arising, right? Through situations that you begin to believe God for getting worse, right? Junk coming at you, all for one purpose to let you get you to let go of the word. And Jesus tells us ahead, you can count on it happening, right? Because this is the way the devil rolls. And many times he uses people. Okay, so don't let that shock you. In fact, in John 15, 20, Jesus said, if they did it to me, they'll do it to you. Right? So you were in good company. They killed him. Matthew 5, 10 to 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Second Timothy. Do you see all the suffering? Okay. Suffering. Second Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that will God live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's that suffering again. Notice it's not sickness or disease or poverty like the devil has tried to pass off. That junk, you're supposed to resist and get rid of. And he's giving you the power to do it. But if you can get you to believe that it's just some of the sufferings that come with the suffering to Christ, you're not going to resist it. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things. Sufferings of Jesus, of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. Suffer persecution. Right? And this time, they wouldn't just falsely accuse him. They'd actually put him on a cross. Okay? Matthew 12, or 17, 12. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Right? Again, notice. I'm going to keep repeating it. Get it changed on that line six of yours. Notice the sufferings of Christ are not sickness or disease or poverty like the devil's tried to pass off. Okay? Partakers of Christ's sufferings resisting temptation to sin, persecution, 
and all the junk that comes with that persecution. Okay? 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27, Paul says this. He says, I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I re received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. He had a rough shipwrecked. A night and a day I'd been in the deep in journeyings often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. I mean, are you hearing me? Paul is no stranger to affliction or persecution. The devil had one agenda with Paul. Get his boots off the ground. Off the ground. Evict him from the planet. Right? Why? Because Paul was a real problem for the devil. Okay, now notice this portion of scripture here that I just read precedes the account of the thorn in the flesh. Another suffering doctrine. Okay, not in this set of classes. Maybe another time I'll offer and I teach on that one, but... Again, God's not made it complicated. We just need to read, right? Read what God wrote instead of listening to man's speculation, right? That's influenced by man's desire to make the word match his experience. Okay? Mark 10, 30. Here Jesus is telling us how, you know, those of us who have left family and um, house and lands for Jesus and the gospel's sake. And so this is what he says to those people. It says, but he, the one who has left all, shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions with persecutions now understand something not everybody's going to be nearly as excited as you are <laughs> when you start receiving stuff of the hundredfold variety for what you have left for the gospel's sake. Okay? And people are going to have something to say about it. Right? And it's usually going to you know, involve referring you to, to you as anything but a nice fellow. Right? Accusations. Speculations. Why? Jealousy comes to visit. And jealousy is an ugly thing. That will get a person to do things and act in ways they never would dreamt that they would act persecution but God said it would come I remember um, a short time ago I was, I was going for my run it's still back in the summer I was going for my run and God began to speak to me about um, how that from a little girl I'm not it's you know, persecution has not been a stranger to me and so he asked me if I would be ready for the kind of persecution that would come as a result of and as uh, from the outpouring of his favor and the prospering that just naturally comes with that. And I thought, because you do a track of all the persecution you've already come through, and then you go, oh, <laughs> right? And um, so I didn't get many more running steps in and before I decided. And so I just remember saying, Father, I don't know if I'm ready or not. But you know if I am. But I was thinking, people fussing over favor? I think I'd get over that. Right? <laughs> and I just, I said to Lord, just give me a second here. Yeah, I'm over it. Right? <laughs> Again, you decide to be over it. You decide, right? You know that saying, get over it? It's exactly like that. Right? You decide to get over it or you decide to stay under it. You choose, right? Choice is powerful. We know that. You choose, though, and God will back you, right? And as long as he's backing you, you can do anything. All things through Christ, Amen. right? Our Gideon, he, uh, he had made a decision, and uh, he was about, maybe about 10 years old. I don't know why it's always Gideon, but anyway. <laughs> if you look at him funny on church, go, what did my mother say? And um, so anyway, um, he had made a decision. And so I had homeschooled all the boys from kindergarten up through uh, um, high school, uh, up to high school. And I thought maybe I should teach them some piano. I'm not a great pianist at all, but I thought I could teach them like something. So I thought I'd teach them some piano. And so here is Gideon. Oh. 
that one needed Jesus. And um, so I was like, you know, I'm saying to Gideon, you take a frustration fit one more time over those keys and you're going to know about it. You know what I mean? And um, so Gideon made a decision to get over it. Okay? And over his frustration and not being musically inclined, like I mean at all. Okay? And so he just turned his hands over like this as a 10 year old kid. He turned his hands over like this and he asked God to anoint his hands to play. Do you know he has never had a lesson in his life for anything? Yet he plays the bass for Lake Mount, he plays the keys. He plays the guitar, and there's more instruments I am just not remembering right now. All right? You choose, and God will back you. Right? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. All right? Okay. What were you talking about again? Persecution. Persecution. We could have left that topic, but anyway. Okay, so now God does clarify a few things here. Okay, and so I'm going to give you the Dorothy translation. Okay, you don't call stuff persecution when you're just being dumb. <laughs> right? When you're acting like a fool. You know what I'm saying? Right? The people that, oh, no, oh, anyways. There's been times that, like, you sit there and you honestly, you're just going, Lord, help my face. Just help my face not reveal anything what I'm thinking right now. When someone goes, I just don't understand. It must be all the wonderful things I'm doing for Jesus because there's such persecution. You just feel like going, let me clue you in. You are a miserable individual. And so when nobody wants to be around, okay, anyway. Um, so don't call that stuff persecution, okay? So it, it, the scriptures um, deal with that as well. First Peter 2.20. But how is it to your credit if you, if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Okay? 1 Peter 3.14. But even if you should suffer for what is right. See where the suffering comes in here? We're not talking to other junk. If you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Okay? So here's the good news. God, the living God, he's our vindicator. Write that scripture. God is on my side. What can man do to me? Right? And with God on your side, the thing's a done deal. Right? It's just a matter of time. Done deal. Right? God says, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Genesis 12. Those who gather together against you will fall for your sake. Isaiah 54. Okay? We do it like Jesus. Where he says, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. 1 Peter 2.13. John 16.33. These things have I spoken unto you. Jesus is talking here again. That in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. Right? And no kidding, we can be of good cheer, right? Jesus overcame it all at the cross, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. That's the whole point, right? For 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. All right? 1 Peter 5, 10. But the God of all grace, who has called us, Everybody here who's called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that, you have suffered a while. Slip in that word, resisted a while. Okay? Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Okay? So hear me again. Whatever Jesus bore on the cross so you would never have it, resist. Okay? Resist the temptation to sin. Resist sickness and poverty and the curse, every part of it. Resist it all. Okay? That is the suffering. The suffering that comes from resisting when your flesh wants to lay down. Right? Stand against the curse with the word of God. It is written. Right? 
Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right? But you have a choice to enter it or not enter it. Okay? Luke 4, 13. And when the devil had emptied all, ended all temptation, he departed from him for a season. <coughs> temptation leaves for a season. Means it'll be back. Right? Resisting is a part of the suffering. As long as there's a devil on the planet, we're going to need to get real good at resisting. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape. That, um, that you may be able to bear it. So again, choice again. There is a way to escape resisting, right? And you are well able to do that. You can resist just like Jesus did, okay? And win, okay? James 1.12, blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Endure temptation, like Jesus did. Stood against it. Matthew 6, 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Right? We're not to pray, again, that temptation be removed, but that we are to be delivered from it. Resist it and be delivered from its ability to pull us into it. Okay? Suffer with him. We suffer resisting and striving against sin. That's the sufferings. We're not to suffer from sickness and lack. Jesus already did that. All right? And Jesus didn't have any of those things except when he took them for us on the cross. So they cannot be the sufferings referred to. Okay? We can't suffer with him in them. This is not complicated. Are you seeing this? Right? We've got to get this right on our line six. Because if you get it wrong, you're going to call sickness, disease, and poverty, and lack, and tragedy, and all that junk, the, the sufferings of Christ stuff. And the afflictions were appointed to stuff. No. No. Satan has sold God's people a lie. He's twisted what God said, just like he did so effectively in the Garden of Eden with Adam. With Eve, right? God said... That Jesus took all of the curse so we wouldn't have to have it. God said, you're going to suffer as you resist the temptation to let go of the word. As you resist sin. But Satan twists it by saying, well, sickness and, and, and stuff from the curse is part of the sufferings, though, Nicole. It's part of the sufferings. Uh-huh. Lie. Lie. And instinctively, you know there's something wrong with that. Right? You really got to work hard to convince yourself that disease and lack and horrible things are part of the deal when you chose Jesus, left the curse, and entered the blessing. Right? In fact, so much so, you keep going to the doctor. Right? If sickness is a part of the afflictions you're pointed to, then stop resisting God by going to the doctor. If, if, um, if lack is part of those afflictions we're pointing to. Stop going to the bank for money. Don't go to work for a paycheck. Right? If lack is a part of the afflictions you're pointed to, the, right? You understand that don't do those things. But the only, the only place we believe that junk is in church. We don't, you can't sell that out there. Okay? Because as soon as we get out of church on Sunday, we go back to work on Monday. Okay? That's not what God's talking about. Okay, so and on the inside, you know it's not right. It does not sit right in your spirit because the spirit of truth lives inside you and that junk is not right. Okay, it's not in agreement with scripture. Okay, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we've got the law of the spirit of life. And that one's in Christ Jesus, has made each one of us free from the law of sin and death and everything that's in that law. Okay? Then Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the blessing may come upon us. 
Okay? So when you choose Jesus, God redeems you out of the curse and places you, he redeems you out of the one and places you in the other. Out of the curse and into the blessing. And you're not to go back over to the curse. Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty with which Christ has made us free. Don't be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. So do you think God's about to sin by going back over where he told you not to go, to join hands with the devil, get some curse to put on you to teach you something? That's ridiculous. Right? Satan is not the teacher of the church. 1 John 2, 27, the anointing is the teacher of the church. John 14, 17 and verse 26, the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. 2 Timothy 3, 15 and to 17, and then Psalm 19, 7 to 11, the word is the teacher of the church. Satan is not the teacher of the church. Okay, if sickness and disease were designed by God to teach, there would be a world full of brilliantly wise people walking around, but it's not. It's not the way it works. Sickness is designed by Satan to evict you out of your body and get you off the planet. Period. Right? God does not work for the devil. Ever. God never has been, nor ever will be employed by the devil. Now, if you go back and visit Egypt and end up coming back with something, that's another story. But don't pin that on God. We've got to get our believing right. Right? Trying to have faith for healing. While in the privacy of your heart, wondering if God gave it to you to teach you something. Two opposing belief systems trying to operate in the same person. Yet God says a house divided against itself can't stand. Right? Mark 3.25. There's no winning that way. We've got to get our believing right. Or how will we ever stand against the curse? Right? Refusing to bow to it. Standing firm on the word of God when pain symptoms and mounting bills are screaming at you to bow. Mm -hmm. To bow your confession to the curse, thereby agreeing with it, what comes out your mouth. That's the, where the sufferings are. Right? When people are pointing out all the yuck that's obvious in the natural, stand. Amen. That's where the suffering, that's the suffering. You understand? Resist it. Whatever Jesus bore on the cross, resist. Stand against anything in the curse. Resist all of it. Again, if you're tempted to think, well, if that's all the sufferings are, doing a little resisting, again, it's quite like you haven't done it yet. Not the way, not, you haven't resisted Satan yet in all the areas you're supposed to resist him in and the way God says to resist him. Okay? Now you watch, you watch the persecution that comes with resisting every part of the curse. It'll surprise you how that bugs people, right? When you gather together with a group of your peers, they all want to watch a movie that's got stuff in it that's in disagreement with the word of God and you remove yourself. You don't even have to say nothing. You just remove yourself and people start to exclude you from their circles. Watch. Right? When God says, you'll have what you say. And you begin to walk in that truth and you begin to watch your words, all of them, so that they line up with the word of God instead. Watch how many feathers you ruffle. Over what you're saying or not saying. It doesn't even have to do with anybody else. When your friend says, you must be thrilled to death your family will be, to, will be together, huh? And you say, well, no, but I'm definitely thrilled. And they roll their eyes and say, why do they need to make something spiritual out of everything? Okay, come on. Right? You watch. Or, you know, somebody says, I hate the flu season when the kids start getting sick, eh? And you just smile and stay quiet because you know what you answering is going to produce. So you just say nothing. They will not drop it. You won't. Am I not right? They won't drop it, right? And it's just like, eh? Dorothy, didn't you hear me? Dorothy, when the kids get sick, eh? Eh? Right? And now you've got to an answer. And you know they're not going to like your answer, right? And so you just say, well, not at my house. No sickness comes near my dwelling. Then watch the hair on people's neck stand up. Right? Right? 
that's nice, Dorothy, but we are still in the world, you know. Right? You start living every detail of your life lined up with the Word of God, especially with your mouth and your words, and you watch people get uncomfortable around you. And you didn't do nothing. Right? And it's not like you're telling them to change their words. Their words are up to them. Okay? Let's just walk through a very practical scenario. So you go home tonight, and... Uh, You've been learning some powerful things in the Word, and you decide that everything's going to change, right? That you're no longer going to put up with the curse, and where you've put up with it before, you've seen it in His Word, and that's it. So, you stop at the grocery store, and you overhear the guy here, and all right, here it goes, already starts. You overhear the guy at the checkout say, oh, the flu's going around, and you just pack your groceries. You refuse agreement with that guy's words. You quietly just think to yourself, not in my dwelling, it doesn't. You don't even say nothing. You just think, not in my dwelling, it doesn't. And then you arrive, arrive home to hear your son Johnny say, Mom, I'm not feeling so well. And then you declare the word over him and you say, Nope, I will not tolerate the curse in my house. By the stripes of Jesus, you were healed, son. And by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed now, Isaiah 53. Symptoms, you bow to the word, to the truth of the word of God and get out. And then your spouse overhears you and said, that's silly, honey. We still live in the world. I mean, we still get the flu from time to time and rolls his eyes and walks away. The pressure's on. You get up the next morning, the devil's been working. And your muscles hurt. And you feel tired. And you're so tempted to talk to symptoms. Right? And the devil's screaming in your thinking, see, the word you've been talking doesn't work. Right? Might as well put your pajamas back on, get back into bed. But you hear Dorothy's voice in your head, well, people go to work. Right? <laughs> and so then your spouse takes one look at you with that look that says, yeah, how's that working for you? Do you, do you see it? Like we're laughing, except how every day is that? Okay, Satan desperately trying to get you to turn loose of the word. So none of those things that I just described shouldn't alarm you. They're not abnormal. Satan doesn't change his methods. So when it happens, I would go, yeah, yeah, anyways. Yeah, yeah. And you keep on what the word has shown you to do, right? These things arise for the word's sake, to get you to let go of the word that you've been planting in your heart for weeks, right? So number one, recognize that the flu is a part of the curse in this situation that you've been redeemed from that you've got no business receiving. So you resist. You take the authority with the word of God, your authority over those symptoms and go on with your day. And don't you let the devil see you sweat. Right? Number three, the persecution from others, those who may even mean well, right? Even from some who maybe don't. But stand strong. Forgive, hold no offense, and just keep declaring the word about it, right? Pray for those making it hard, knowing that if they did it to Jesus, they're going to do it to you. It shouldn't be a big shocker, all right? And don't budge off what God said about it, okay? Let's go to Mark 4 um, once more for a minute. I need you to see something. I'm going to read now verses 14 to 20. So I have read the first part, but I just want you to hear it again. I'm going to write down to verse 20. Okay. The sower sows the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Or cross-reference here says stumble. And these are they which sown, are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things in entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Okay, so now I'm going to read verses 21 and 22. 
And he said, so he continues what he's talking about. And he said, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set at a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. Do you ever wonder why those two verses follow the verses about the word being sown in people's hearts and what happens in the different scenarios? Okay, now watch this. Psalm 119.30 says this. The entrance of his word gives light. Okay? The entrance of his word gives, gives light. So when the word enters a man, as you read it, light enters. <clears throat> and that light cannot be hid. All that word that just went into you the word that persecution and affliction rises, uh, rises up to let, get you to let go of, that word enters you and gives light. Are you, are you seeing this? Okay. Now Hebrews 10. Okay. Let me um, turn over there. Hebrews 10. I read a few verses there. So watch this. And start at verse 32. <laughs> but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated. See how this works? Recall or break, call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Okay, now I'm going to go to verse, I'll keep going next verse. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, or cross-reference, an object of ridicule, both by reproaches and afflictions. And partly while you became companions of them that were so used. So you became buddies of those who were facing the same stuff. Okay, and then verses 35 to 38. Cast not away therefore your confidence which is great recompense or great promise of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Okay, so, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated. Light came from the word entering. You then endured a great struggle with sufferings. Right? Sufferings that come, afflictions was the word used there. Okay? Partly while you were made a gazing stock or a, a object of ridicule. Okay? Um, with reproaches and tribulations. Okay? It goes on to say, do you see all this? All this persecution showing up on the heels of the word of God entering you. Light entering you. You becoming illuminated. Okay? When you actually begin on purpose to take the word of God with the intent to believe right. Walk in the light of it. And operate fully in the laws that govern faith. That govern the receiving from God. Suffering, affliction, persecution on account of the devil not liking it will show up. Okay? That is what's God, that's what God's talking about with those words. Afflictions and sufferings. Okay? That's what God's referring to in the partaking of Christ's sufferings. Right? But the devil, as is always his strategy, he gets believers cleaning up sugar in aisle four. Correct? Right? Get some busy managing sickness and disease sufferings. And junk out of the curse sufferings. That they believe, right, is just a part of Christ's sufferings that believers get to be part of. Right? And none of those were ever Christ's sufferings. At all. He never suffered with any of that. He successfully resisted it all. And, right? And, 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 it, the only time that that junk ever touched him was when he took it at the cross. I've said this already. And even that, he sweat drops of blood over. Right? And then he was made to be the curse for us. 
every sickness, disease, poverty, right, sin and bondage to sin and every other foul thing under the curse, he took. So you and I would never have to have it. That was the whole point of the cross. Are you seeing this? All right? The fight, the afflictions, the temptations, the sufferings, the persecutions are all for the word's sake to get you to let go of it, to stop operating in it. But these, God said, we can expect will come. These you endure as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Okay? And then let's go one last one. Second Timothy. Second Timothy two. I'm going to read verses 1 right through 12. 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 12. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit you to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Notice he doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Doesn't get caught up with the junk that he's already been redeemed from out of the curse. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that um, labors must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble, as an evildoer even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will also deny us. Okay, so you don't endure sickness and disease, poverty, lack, fear, bondage, anything else that's part of the curse. That stuff you resist. Those you take authority over and you resist, and they will have to flee. Okay, so just real quick recap. Afflictions are circumstances fighting against you, for the word's sake. Persecutions, people coming against you, for the word's sake. Sufferings, right? Involved with afflictions and persecutions, yes. And suffering involved with resisting temptation, resisting sin, resisting the curse. And still all for the word's sake. The temptation to steal is to get you to let go of, my God shall supply all my need. The temptation to sin is still to get you to let go of the word. Okay, the temptation to retaliate is to get you to let go of vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Those who gather together against you will fall for your sake. Are you seeing this? It all comes back. All those things all along is what God warned us about in Mark 4, that these things are going to come against you for one reason, to get the word of God out of you. Because it will change everything. But the enemy comes in, gets you clean up sugar on aisle four, busy with all the other junk that you ought not even be busy with. You resist it, boot it out, and go on with life doing what you got to do. Amen. Make sense? Amen. Okay. All right. That's it. We're done a little early tonight, I think. Rosalia, do you have anything, Joe? <laughs> was a really good word that I heard afresh and anew tonight and as you were sharing what you were teaching us um, 
it kept coming to me that when we're resisting the devil in a situation, my husband and I, the thing that I kept hearing over and over with what you were saying is John 10, 10. Mm. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or that they may have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. So that is when we're resisting the devil, what keeps coming to us in our fight or in our walk. Wait a minute. If he came to give us life in abundance, if he's the good shepherd and he laid down his life for us, then this junk of what you're teaching tonight it's contradicting itself. Either we're suffering in those things or we're gonna take what he says to us and believe it. So the more that we hear this, the more that we read the word, the more that that faith enters in, it becomes easier for us to resist the devil. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it. Mm -hmm. It does, it doesn't, before it used to be like more of a fear, where now it's, wait a minute, this is what God says. So if he's saying this, it can't contradict itself. So yeah. I just kept remembering, as you were teaching, I kept hearing that over and over and over yeah. of what he did for us. Yeah. So that's yeah. it. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's putting that word of God in you, in you, in you, to the point where it is ridiculous <coughs> to you that you're gonna put up with junk. You just look and go, I don't think so. Amen. You don't even have to check the scriptures about it. It's in you, and you're just going, I ain't putting up with that move along right i got authority over you get off my business right like you're just you don't put up with it anymore but it takes getting that word in 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 renewing your mind changing the way you think about those things instead of an oh no you just go that's ridiculous i don't need to be concerned about that out the door that goes right? and you know with what she's just saying in that right now is um the testimony will come it's not ready to be spoken yet or shared but we had to resist the devil in something really strong in our life this week um, that had to do with one of our grandchildren. And I mean resist the devil. A couple of nights we didn't go to bed. We resisted the devil. But I remember saying, hold on. There was no fear. Hold on. Yeah. You know how they say that, dark, that dog is barking up the wrong tree? Yeah. Satan, yeah. you are roaring against the wrong family. Yeah. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. And we have victory over it. Amen. Yeah. But it's exactly yeah. what she is saying. We've, we're living it and we've yeah. lived it. So that, yeah, that's that just awesome. keeping the word in front of us. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah.